All right, welcome back. Lesson 4.3, part two, trigonometry extended the circular function. In this lesson, we're gonna focus on actually evaluating using the unit circle. So at this point, you've watched the first part of this lesson. You have taken the necessary time to sit down and actually memorize the unit circle, and you are actually ready to start evaluating. Now, as a pop quiz, let's go ahead and pause the video right here, take four minutes, pull out a blank sheet of paper, draw a circle, draw 16 coordinates on it, and draw a complete unit circle from memory. Once you're done, hold it up to the screen and I will check to see if it's right. Pause here, hit play when you're ready. All right, hopefully you took me seriously and actually did what I asked you to do, or at least part of it. If you are actually holding your paper up to the computer screen for me to check it, then learning trigonometry is the least of your concern. As I said, in this lesson we are going to continue with our learning goal. We've already talked about finding trig of unknown angles. Right now we're going to look at trig of known angles using the 16 point unit circle. Now what you just did, redrawing the entire unit circle from memory, is exactly what you are going to do on a test. As soon as you get a test on trigonometry, the first thing you need to do is not read the directions or read question one or even write your name on the test. The first thing you're going to do is pull out a blank sheet of paper or turn your test over to the blank side and draw a complete unit circle from memory. Because you're going to have to use it several times during the test, you don't want to have to draw a unit circle for every single question that you do. You want to draw one unit circle draw that one unit circle perfectly correctly, and then use that unit circle to help you evaluate however many unit circle related questions happen to be on the test. Now, the bad part of that is, if you don't know your unit circle, or you make a mistake on your unit circle, you're not gonna get one question wrong, you're gonna get a bunch of questions wrong. That is the importance of making sure that you are flawless in drawing your unit circle. Trust me, with practice, it will come. Now I do have another secret to go along with it. You don't need the entire unit circle. You only need the first quadrant. As long as you know the first quadrant by heart as well as your identities and certain relationships, then you don't need the whole unit circle. Now you should be familiar with the whole unit circle. If you see 315 degrees pop up in a question, it should be evident to you immediately when you look at it that, hey, 315 is a unit circle angle. I know how to evaluate that versus if you see 315 and have no idea that it's a unit circle angle, then you would have no idea how to approach it. Because the way you approach a 315 degree angle is very different from how you approach a 314 degree angle. 314 is not on the unit circle, thus would require a calculator or some more advanced techniques in order to solve. Your first step is to recognize, hey, this is a unit circle problem, let's use my unit circle techniques. If it's not a unit circle problem, you need completely different techniques. So let's go through the steps of evaluating trig of any known angle. Anytime I refer to a known angle, I'm referring to a unit circle angle. So step one is to determine the quadrant. The first thing we have to do is figure out which quadrant is the angle in. So in other words, just like we did back in the last lesson, or at least section two, when we were talking about coterminal angles. I would give you some random angle, and I asked you to not only find coterminal angles, but I asked you to sketch it. That's really what we're doing here. We're kind of like sketching it. I don't necessarily need to sketch it, but I need to know what quadrant it's in. If I give you a 1500 degree angle, I need to know what quadrant it's in. If it's 1500 degrees, it's too big, so we can use that concept of coterminal angles to add or subtract either 360 or 2 pi, depending on if it's degrees or radians, until I can determine what quadrant it's in. Remember, my quadrants are defined between 0 and 360, or 0 and 2 pi in radians, so I'm going to add or subtract until my angle is within one of those intervals. Notice, I use a bracket on 0, a parenthesis on 360, because of course 0 and 360 are coterminal. If the angle is 360, then the angle is 0. We don't want to double up our angles, so it's common to exclude 360 from our from our angle possibilities and include zero, although that's completely arbitrary. There's no reason I have to do that. That's just the conventional wisdom. Include zero, but don't include 360. Step two, determine the reference angle for theta. So if theta is in the first quadrant, no reference angle is needed. But if theta is in any other quadrant, then I need to know what the reference angle actually is. For example, 
if my angle is in the second quadrant, I need to know what the related first quadrant angle is. Because if I'm at 135 degrees, well 135 degrees has the exact same coordinate as 45 degrees. So as long as I know that 135 has a reference angle of 45 degrees, because it's 45 degrees above the x-axis, then I can evaluate 135 the same way I would evaluate 45. And because 135 is in the second quadrant, I know to evaluate it as positive or negative based on the positive negative rules. So if I'm in the second quadrant, I can find that reference angle simply by subtracting 180, which is the x-axis, minus theta. So again, if it's 135 degrees, 180 minus 135 is 45. So I would then use 45 in all of my calculations. If I'm in the third quadrant, I would do theta minus 180, because of course it's, when you're subtracting it's always the bigger number that comes first. So to find that reference angle, the bigger number would be theta itself, the smaller number would be 180. I'm comparing to the x-axis, so I'm using 180 in my subtraction. So if it was a 225 degree angle, 225 minus 180 is 45. 225 behaves like a 45 degree angle, but it's in the third quadrant, not the first. If I'm in the fourth quadrant, I'm not comparing to 180. If I compare to the x-axis, the x-axis is 360. So to get my reference angle in the fourth quadrant, I would subtract from 360, not 180. Now notice I gave all of this in reference to degrees, 180 degrees, 360 degrees. Here is another reason why radians are far superior to degrees. I don't really need to do any work to figure out reference angles for radians. If the angle is 5 pi over 6, the reference angle is pi over 6. If the angle is 7 pi over 4, the reference angle is pi over 4. The reference angle in radians is hidden within the angle itself in radians. Whatever the pi over denominator is, that's your reference angle. Everything is just multiples of those. Pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6 have the same coordinate, except of course the x value is negative. But they behave the same way, as long as I know 5 pi over 6 is in the second quadrant, versus 1 pi over 6 is in the first quadrant, x is negative in the second quadrant, x is positive in the first quadrant, I can treat 5 pi over 6 and 1 pi over 6 the same. Pi over 6 is the reference angle for 5 pi over 6, and for 7 pi over 6, and for 11 pi over 6. I love radians, because they save me time. Step three, once I know what quadrant I'm in and I know what the reference angle is, now we're ready to evaluate the trig function using the reference angle. So as long as I know what the first quadrant coordinates are, if the angle is 7 pi over 4, 7 pi over 4 is in the fourth quadrant, pi over 4 is my reference angle, pi over 4 is root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2, so I know I can evaluate the sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, or cotangent using my trig definitions. Just remember that sine is the y value, cosine is the x value, and everyone else can be found using either tangent identities or reciprocal identities. As long as you know that sine is y and cosine is x, you can find everyone else using identities. For example, tangent is just y over x. If I know the y coordinate and know the x coordinate, then I can find tangent by y over x, cotangent is x over y, secant, cosecant, cotangent, flip, flip, flip. Also, beyond that, remember that all students take calculus. All the trig functions are positive in quadrant one. Sine is positive in quadrant two, which means everyone else is negative, or I should say sine and cosecant are positive, everyone else is negative. Tangent and cotangent positive, everyone else is negative. Cosine and secant are positive, everyone else is negative. Once I've got all that, I can answer any trig question you throw at me, as long as it's one of my known unit circle angles. So, let's do a whole bunch of them. Let's just go one by one. I'll do one, you do one, and follow in that pattern. Starting with the cosine of 585 degrees. So, first thing I'm going to do is recognize this is in degrees, so I'm going to do all of my work with reference to degrees. Now, let's start with the angle, 585 degrees. Uh, first thing I need to know is where is 585 degrees? Now, that is not one of my unit circle angles, necessarily, so I don't automatically know where it is, so I'm going to use coterminal angles to reduce it down to one of my unit circle angles. So, 585, it's in degrees, so I'll start by subtracting 360. 
5 minus 3 is 2, 8 minus 6 is 2, 5 minus 0 is 5, so 225. So cosine of 585 degrees, since 585 and 225 are coterminal, that means cosine of 585 and cosine of 225 are equivalent as well. These statements are equal. They are the same thing. So instead of evaluating cosine of 585, let's evaluate cosine of 225. Now, 225 is an angle I recognize. If you didn't have your unit circle memorized, then you probably wouldn't recognize 225. So, since I have 225 recognized, I know that's in quadrant 3, so that tells me that since I'm doing cosine in quadrant 3, my answer has to be negative. So you could kind of say I've got half of my answer at this point. I know my answer is negative something. Don't know what the number is yet, let's proceed from here. Now, of course, if I have my entire unit circle memorized and I wrote down my entire unit circle earlier, then I can simply look at the 225 degree angle. Cosine is the x value. Look at the x coordinate at the 225 degree angle and boom, I'm done. I have my answer. I see that it's negative something. But if you're like me and you like to take shortcuts anywhere you possibly can, you never actually wrote down the entire unit circle. You only wrote down the first quadrant because you know that all the quadrants are technically the same, it's just the same numbers over and over again, the same numbers that appear in the first quadrant. So that's what I'm going to do from here. I'm only ever going to use the first quadrant. So since I only know the first quadrant coordinates, my next step is to find my first quadrant reference angle. So 225 is in the third quadrant. The reference angle is with respect to 180. So I'm going to do 225 minus 180 to get my reference angle. So 225 minus 180 would be 45. 225 is the 45 degree angle in the third quadrant. So now, since I know my unit circle within the first quadrant at least, 45 degrees has the coordinate root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2. Cosine is the x value, so I need the x value of that coordinate, root 2 over 2. I know the answer was negative from before, so my final answer, negative root 2 over 2. So I used coterminal angles to reduce it down to a manageable number. I then used my reference angle to figure out what the coordinate was. Since it was cosine, I wanted the x value of that coordinate. Since the original angle was in the third quadrant, it was negative, so negative root 2 over 2. As you practice this more and more, you get a lot quicker with this. Why don't you try the next one on your own? Hit play when you're ready. So we have a negative 600 degree angle that is way too small. We're not going to subtract 360 because that would just make it smaller. We will add 360. So when I add 360, I get negative 240. Now 240 is a number that I recognize, but it's not positive 240, it's negative 240. It's still too small. So let's add 360 again to make it a little bit bigger, and I get 120. So it wasn't 240 that I was looking for, it was 120 that I'm looking for. 120 is in the second quadrant. Since we're using a sine ratio in the second quadrant, I know that I'm positive. So I know the sine of negative 600 degrees is going to be a positive answer. So next, let's just find the reference angle for 120. 120, again, is in the second quadrant. So if I compare that to 180 by subtracting, I get a reference angle of 60 degrees. So instead of saying sine of 120, let's find the sine of 60 degrees. So 60 degrees is the fourth dot in my first quadrant and I only need the y value of that coordinate, so if I look at the first quadrant of my unit circle, 60 degrees, y value is going to be root 3 over 2, and since I am in the second quadrant, my answer is positive, my answer is positive. Sine of negative 600 degrees, root 3 over 2. Alright, here are two more, but this time let's switch over to radians, and you need to be prepared to jump back and forth, sometimes it's in degrees, sometimes it's in radians. And as I will always argue, radians are easier than degrees. So let's do the first one together, and then I'll give you the second one on your own. So 15 pi over 4. Now right off the bat, I see pi over 4. My reference angle is going to be pi over 4. I'm kind of skipping ahead a little bit, but I know my this is going to be a pi over 4 angle. So I know my answer is either going to be root 2 over 2 or negative root 2 over 2 because, of course, it's cosine of pi over 4. The only thing I really need to do is figure out which quadrant I'm in. So to figure out the quadrant, let's use our coterminal angles. 15 over 4 is too big. So, so let's subtract 2 pi until we find an angle that's a more manageable size. So in terms of pi over 4, subtracting 2 pi would really be subtracting 8 pi over 4. So that would be 
7 pi over 4. So 15 pi over 4 becomes 7 pi over 4, which is in the fourth quadrant. So since I'm in the fourth quadrant for cosine, cosine is always positive in the fourth quadrant, so I know my answer is going to be positive. And as I said before, with radians, all you have to do is ignore the coefficient, and you've got your reference angle. Cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2, so my answer is positive root 2 over 2. So tangent of 5 pi over 6, why don't you try this one on your own? The only thing I'm going to tell you extra is remember that tangent is sine divided by cosine. Give it a try, hit play when you're ready. All right, so tangent of 5 pi over 6. So this time 5 pi over 6 is already one of my known unit circle angles. No coterminal angles are necessary on this one. I'm already ready to identify what quadrant it's in. 5 pi over 6 is in the second quadrant. Since it's tangent in the second quadrant, my answer has to be negative. Now, how do I evaluate tangent? Remember, there's no coordinate for tangent. The, tan the coordinate is an x and a y, a cosine and a sine. Tangent has an identity. Tangent is sine divided by cosine. As long as you remember that tangent is sine over cosine or y over x, evaluating tangent is really evaluating sine and cosine and then dividing your answers. So let's do that. Now, of course, first off, let's get our reference angle, 5 pi over 6. Ignore the 5. Our reference angle is pi over 6. So when I look at my unit circle, I just need the coordinate for pi over 6. Now, remember, I don't just need the x value or the y value. I need both of them because tangent is sine over cosine. Tangent of pi over 6 is equivalent to saying sine of pi over 6 divided by cosine of pi over 6. Looking at my unit circle, the y value at pi over 6 is 1 half. The cosine is root 3 over 2. I've got a fraction divided by a fraction. I could waste time by doing keep it, change it, flip it. Or I can realize I'm a pre-calculus student and just say, hey, denominators are the same. Cancel them out. I'm left with 1 over root 3. 1 over root 3 is technically an answer, but I'm going to simplify it to root 3 over 3, slap a negative in front, and call it an answer. Tangent of 5 pi over 6 is negative root 3 over 3. All right, here are two more. Why don't you try these on your own? Hit play when you're ready. So the first one is cosecant. Remember to evaluate cosecant, you're just going to evaluate sine and flip it upside down. Remember cosecant is 1 divided by sine. So our angle is negative 5 pi over 6. Negative angles are too small, so we're going to add 2 pi to make it bigger. In terms of pi over 6, I would be adding 12 pi over 6. So my coterminal angle would be 7 pi over 6. 7 pi over 6 is in the third quadrant. Cosecant, which behaves just like sine in the third quadrant, is going to be negative. So I know my answer is going to be negative. Since it's 7 pi over 6, I know my reference angle is pi over 6. So I'm going to evaluate using the pi over 6 coordinate. And remember, since it's cosecant, I'm really looking at the sine ratio. So sine is the y value. y value at pi over 6 is 1 half. So it really says 1 divided by 1 half. Or I can just think of if sine is 1 half, cosecant, just flip it upside down, and I get 2. Or, of course, negative 2, because remember, I was in the third quadrant. Cosecant of negative 5 pi over 6 is negative 2. If you haven't done F on your own yet, go ahead and hit pause, hit play when you're ready. Sine of 855, I need to make it smaller, so I'm going to subtract 360. Now, I know that number is large enough that subtracting 360 is not going to be sufficient, so might as well make things a little bit easier on ourselves. Instead of subtracting 360 and then doing it again, let's just go ahead and subtract 720 the first time. So when I subtract 720, I'm left with 135. 135, of course, is in the second quadrant, and since it's sine in the second quadrant, the answer is going to be positive. 135 has a reference angle, so if we subtract it from 180, the reference angle is going to be 45. Sine of 45, both the x and y value at 45 is root 2 over 2, so the sine is obviously root 2 over 2. It's positive, so positive root 2 over 2. Two more, try them out, hit play when you're ready. All right, secant of negative 240. Negative 240 is too small, so add 360 to make it bigger. We get 120. 120 is in the second quadrant. And second quadrant for secant, which behaves like cosine, is always going to be negative. 120 compared to 180, reference angle is 60 degrees. Secant of 60 degrees, which is equivalent to 1 over cosine of 60 degrees. So the cosine at 60, the x value at the 60 degree angle is 1 half. Flip the 1 half upside down and we get 2, but of course it's negative 2. Now cotangent of 2 pi over 3, if you haven't done it already, hit pause, hit play when you're ready.
Cotangent of 2 pi over 3. 2 pi over 3 is already known to be in the second quadrant. Cotangent in the second quadrant is negative. Our reference angle would just be pi over 3, so we can jump straight to that. Cotangent, remember, is the reciprocal of tangent. Tangent is y over x, so cotangent is x over y. In other words, cosine over sine. So just look at your unit circle, pi over 3. The x coordinate over the y coordinate would be 1 half over root 3 over 2, or 1 over root 3. As before, 1 over root 3 simplifies to root 3 over 3, but of course negative, so negative root 3 over 3. All right, last two. Pause here, hit play when you're ready. So tangent of 5 pi. 5 pi is not one of my known unit circle angles, so let's subtract 2 pi until I find it. If I subtract 2 pi, I would end up with 3 pi. If I subtract 2 pi again, I would end up with 1 pi. So really, I could just subtract 4 pi once and get 1 pi. Tangent of pi. Pi, of course, is my coordinate at the 180 degree mark, the negative x-axis. So since pi is one of my quadrantals, that really doesn't tell me whether tangent is positive or negative. I know in the second quadrant tangent is negative. I know in the third quadrant tangent is positive, but it doesn't really tell me what's happening on the actual quadrantal. So let's keep going. We're not quite sure whether it's negative or positive yet. Maybe the sine and cosine ratio will answer that question for me. So I know tangent is sine over cosine, sine of pi over cosine of pi. Remember that pi, at pi the coordinate is negative 1, 0, so the y value for sine is 0, the cosine value is negative 1. And of course 0 over negative 1 is 0, so that worry that we had earlier about not knowing whether it's positive or negative actually didn't matter, because of course 0 is just 0, it's neither positive nor negative. Last one, try this one on your own, hit play when you're ready. So cosine of negative 360 degrees, we can simply add 360 once and get to 0 degrees, so let's find the cosecant of 0. 0 degrees, just like pi, is not in a quadrant, it's on one of my quadrantals, so I don't know whether it's positive or negative, let's just look at the coordinate. The coordinate at 0 is 1, 0, so when I set this up as 1 over sine of 0, sine of 0 is 0, so I get 1 over 0, and 1 over 0, once again, is neither positive nor negative, nor is it even a number. 1 over 0, 0 on the bottom is undefined, so the cosecant of negative 360 is undefined. Anytime you end up with 0 on the bottom, it's undefined. So that's it. That's all she wrote. That's everything you need to know about the unit circle. And remember, practice, 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 practice. The only way you get good, th good at this is practice. So make sure that you are practicing. Continue to practice drawing your unit circle from memory to make sure that you don't make little mistakes. Positives and negatives are the most common mistakes to make. And then after that it would be switching the root 3 over 2 and 1 halves. Make sure you're putting those in the right order. Remember it increases vertically from bottom to top. It increases from left to right in the first quadrant. So moving forward, make sure that you have memorized all of your trig definitions and identities. If you haven't done it so far, get moving. I don't know how you would have been able to get through this lesson without knowing your definitions and identities by heart. If you haven't already memorized your unit circle, get going. Again, I have no idea how you got through this lesson if you didn't already know your unit circle. As I said before, our daily pop quizzes are going to continue, and now they're going to include not only your definitions and identities, not only the unit circle in terms of the degrees and radians, but also the complete coordinates now. So you need to be very, 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 very good at it in order to be successful with everything that's coming forward uh, in the rest of our course. So until next time.